welcome once again to the Wood Green Salvation Army YouTube channel. This is the first in our new series of Bible talks based around the I Am sayings of Jesus to be found in the Gospel of John. And as you'll have seen from our reading in John chapter 6 and verses 25 to 59, today we are considering Jesus' statement, I am the bread of life. Some of you will know that I like to cook and to bake, and I've only recently started baking my own bread, as you can see. Now, bread is something that we here in the UK generally take a bit for granted. We just assume that when we go to the local shop or the supermarket or the baker's, that there will be bread of all types on the shelves, and also strong flour and yeast if we want to make our own. And of course we also take for granted that we'll have enough money to pay for it all. Of course, bread is also an integral part of lots of other food products like sandwiches, breadcrumb fish or meat, bread and butter pudding, so on and so forth. It's what we call in the UK a staple food. Because as a nation, we eat it in large quantities and it provides a large part of our nutrition because it's high in carbohydrates, which we need, of course, for physical energy, so that we can do stuff. And of course, bread is a staple food, not just in the UK, but in many cultures around the world. Sometimes, something that's really easy to spot when I do my food shopping, and I see breads from France, from Poland, from Germany, from India, from Turkey, on the shelves. Indeed, I had a brand new bread-related experience when I first moved to Wood Green, because as I walked up Lordship Lane for the first time, I saw Turkish gözlemi, bread, I think that's how you say it, being made and filled with feta and spinach, and then cooked on a, a saktaba, uh, a Turkish concave pan in the window of the Turkish bakers. It smelled great. And of course, purely in the service of cultural research, I had to go in and buy one. So around the world, bread is an essential food. Indeed, for those in food poverty, bread might be the only food they have at times. And of course, given that we all must eat to live, it's no surprise that bread has become a symbol for life itself in many cultures and religions. This was certainly true for the culture that Jesus of Nazareth grew up in. The, Jews, the Jewish uh, scriptures that he learned as a child contained the history of a largely agricultural society that depended on growing wheat and barley to feed its people. The defining moment of the Jewish history was the exodus from Egypt and the Israelites' subsequent nomadic, nomadic wandering in the desert for 40 years before they entered the Promised Land. This huge group of people were only able to survive in the desert for 40 years because God supplied them with bread, bread from heaven, which they called manna, which miraculously appeared on the floor of the desert each day. The manna kept them alive in the desert all those years and taught them that God and God alone was the giver and sustainer of life. So I guess it's no surprise that the Jews would make bread a religious symbol for human life and in Jesus' day having one's daily bread to eat still largely determined whether one would live or die as indeed in many places it does today. During this current pandemic, our church has become more and more involved in providing food for hungry families. And indeed, my wife Paula has become involved in the Haringey Food Poverty Network, which is developing a strategy to help alleviate food poverty in our borough. As we know, hunger has all kinds of bad effects on people's health and well-being, both physical and mental. And if it's not addressed, Hunger can lead, at the very least, to poor educational performance and emotional distress. And in the worst cases, it can lead to poor health and early death. Because of the proliferation of food banks and community canteens in our country today, we are being re regularly reminded how vital food is to life. Not just the quality of life, but even the longevity of it. Sadly, Elsewhere in the world, there are communities right now where people barely have enough to eat, and indeed several countries where famine is actually happening, such as 
Malawi, Mozambique, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Somalia and Ethiopia. Much of this shortage of food in Africa is being driven by problems of drought and flooding. But in places like Nigeria, South Sudan and Syria and the Yemen, the famines there are being driven by armed conflicts. So obviously no one needs to remind these hungry communities how essential to life bread is, which begs some important questions which we might want to just take a moment now to consider. Living as we do in a country in which most people don't struggle to obtain food, what then do the majority of us consider essential for our lives? Is it a job? Is it money? Is it housing or health care, holidays, socialising, music, sport, pastimes, a sense of achievement? And who do we think should provide that essential thing for our lives to us? Are we perhaps justified in being more focused on how we live our lives rather than just staying alive? And does that mean we see being alive itself as a human right that is accepted and honoured by all? which means we just have to concentrate on what kind of life we might lead and how we achieve that. As I've already said, in the Palestine of Jesus' time, bread was a powerful symbol for life, which pointed to the ultimate source of life, God the creator and preserver. And part of Jesus' mission, whilst on earth, was to reveal the true nature of this life from God. Jesus taught and demonstrated that life was not something that could be ended by death because life was too powerful a thing for death to destroy. Now, my family is a grace-saying family. We choose to say grace together before meals and of course we also do it individually when we're on our own. And I hope if you are a Christian uh, whenever you eat together with others, or even on your own, you too say grace. Uh, what we mean by saying grace, of course, is that we stop before we eat to say a prayer of thanks to God for providing the food that we are about to eat. In the UK, we call it saying grace, but in other places, in other cultures, it's called various things like the blessing, or saying the blessing, or blessing the food. And talking about blessing, uh, one of the earliest graces I ever learned was Bless this food which now we take, and keep us good for Jesus' sake. I'm sure many of you know that one too. And you will often hear people asking God to bless this food to our bodies. Now I like this idea of blessing the food. Because it suggests that you're asking God to ensure that the food you're about to eat will make you healthy and strong, and give you the energy you need for the day ahead. Although praying this doesn't let you off, having to keep the food safe and cooking it properly. And this blessing idea suggests that there's something in the food that God has put there which will help to give us life. A strong, healthy, productive life. And it's this idea of life-giving food that Jesus picks up on in John chapter 6. And then he uses it to explain to his audience why he's come here amongst them as a miracle worker, healer and teacher. In verse 35 he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now that's some kind of God-blessed bread, isn't it? A bread you can eat that will mean you will never ever be hungry and thirsty again. Now, unsurprisingly, the crowd are by turns sceptical and confused as to what Jesus is actually saying here. So Jesus goes on to explain to them that he is the bread of life because, unlike ordinary bread or food or material things or money, he, and he alone, can provide them with eternal life, with joy and peace and love that will never run out, with life that doesn't depend on the next meal or the next paycheck, or the next relationship to keep going. Now the crowd that Jesus is speaking to uh, are only really interested in getting hold of some more free bread which Jesus has been handing out on the shores of the Sea of Galilee at the beginning of chapter 6. 
having blessed the donated five loaves and two fish. But Jesus is trying to get them to grasp that the God who gave them their present lives and the bread to sustain it is wanting to give them eternal life by giving them the bread of life, Jesus himself. He tells them, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. I think what Jesus is saying here is that we need to understand that our material, time-bound lives derive from a spiritual, eternal source, which is God. And it's the source of our physical life on earth. And it's also the enveloping environment in which our life on this planet exists. The spiritual realm or dimension inhabited by God is more important than our material realm. Jesus makes it plain in his teaching. We humans live for a certain time and then we die. And no amount of eating and drinking, farming or industry or commerce or mystical experiences can change that. Nothing we can do can extend our lives for more than a few measly years at best. As the well-known saying goes, the only certain things in this world are death and taxes. But Jesus came to earth from heaven to defeat human death. Jesus came to bring life. As he says in John chapter 10 verse 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And whilst many interpret this abundance as experiencing the living presence of Jesus among us and within us through the Holy Spirit whilst we live here now, this life on earth, abundance might also be interpreted as a superabundance of life that even death cannot end, what Jesus calls eternal life, which means being resurrected from the death to life at the end of time to exist forever with God in heaven. And what needs to be said about eternal life is that it is good. Life is good. Even when we're having a tough time, to be alive is still good. If only because whilst we're not dead, with God out there and around us and only a prayer away, there is always hope for change. And it's Jesus who brings that goodness of life. If ever there was a blessed bread, that is Jesus. And what Jesus goes on to explain to his disciples later in chapter 6 is that faith in him allows his life and goodness to enter your own body and spirit. In the same way that eating some nourishing bread brings life to our body. It's this idea of God's eternal spiritual life entering into us by faith that lays behind Jesus' strange words in verses 53 and 50, uh, to 57. Here they are. Jesus said to them, Very truly I say to you, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. These words are, of course, highly suggested, suggestive of the communion rite or Eucharist that has been a feature of church worship for centuries. But that rite or sacrament or ceremony of the church is merely symbolic of a spiritual reality. Jesus is here using the metaphor of consuming food in order to give our bodies life as a means to help us to understand how utterly essential faith in Jesus' person and works, in particular his work on the cross, is for our lives, both our life on this earth and for our eternal life in heaven.
for people who are not Christians, if they take these words about eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood literally, then they are indeed strange words. Indeed, the people to whom they were originally addressed also appeared to take them literally and clearly thought they were outrageous. John 6 and 52 says, Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And if someone was to take these words literally today, then they would perhaps be justified in being repelled by the seemingly cannibalistic nature of the central act of worship of the majority of Christian churches. But of course, Jesus is being metaphorical. When he spoke these words, it was around the time of the Jewish festival of Passover, which commemorates the Exodus, and in particular the moment when Jewish households sacrificed a perfect lamb the evening before they left Egypt. The blood of this lamb was smeared on the doors of Jewish dwellings and prevented the angel of death from entering their homes. This was an act of God providing the Jews with a means for life over death at the Exodus. And in talking about people consuming his flesh and drinking his blood, Jesus is saying that God was doing his salvation work again. He was providing a new sacrifice that would bring life. Jesus would be that sacrifice by being put to death on the cross. But this time, the sacrifice would bring eternal life to anyone, Jew and Gentile, who applied its truth to themselves in faith, to those who chose to eat it and drink it. But how could the broken and pierced body of the crucified Jesus be the bread of life? Well, by being the means for forgiveness. The Bible often speaks about the relationship between sin and death. Every time we sin, every time we do something that the, the God of life doesn't want us to do, then we bring more death, more destruction into the world. When we do good, we bring life to ourselves and to the world. But when we sin, we bring death. So what can we do about the death that we've brought into the world through our sins, both individually and collectively? We need forgiveness. We need a gracious, loving, life-giving God to forgive us. And Jesus' flesh and blood, broken and poured out on the cross, make that forgiveness possible. Having been forgiven our sins, released from the death surrounding us and restored to life, we can now go on to live our eternal life, the life of the resurrected Jesus, bringing life to others because the bread of life, the life of Jesus, is within us by faith. That's the meaning of these strange words about feeding on flesh and blood. Our faith that Jesus has saved us from the death, from death by the sacrifice of his body, our faith gives us life and helps us to bring life to the world through our good works and through our proclamation of the truth about Jesus. And Jesus' strange words about his sacrifice are true for us too, because we too will need to sacrifice ourselves to some extent in order to be for others to be saved from the death that surrounds them and to live eternally. But by faith, we can have the confidence that Jesus had before his death, knowing that the life of God which was within him could not be defeated by death, but he, that he would rise again and ascend to heaven. And that's the great promise of the bread of life for all of us. One of the great truths contained within the communion ceremony is the idea that Christians share life together because they share a faith in Christ. And when I say, say uh, share life, I mean life in capital letters with an exclamation mark. <laughs> when we think about the world with all its societies and communities, we're all too aware of sins and darkness and death. It surrounds us in hateful speech and acts, in carelessness, in selfishness, we can even sometimes find the shadow of sin and death in our own minds and lives. Destruction and death are part of our life experience here now on earth, for some more than others. Everything that is good in the world brings life. And by faith, we know that everything good comes from God. 
Let's continue then to put our faith in Jesus and by doing so to feed on the bread of life. If we do this, we will surely witness his eternal life spreading out and ch chasing death away wherever we find ourselves and wherever we go. By faith, chasing death and destruction out of the lives of all those that we meet. The sight and smell and taste of freshly baked bread is still one of life's greatest pleasures, particularly when you're hungry. How much more life-giving and wonderful is the experience of the presence of Jesus in our lives through faith. I pray that each day you may all taste and see that the Lord is good.